Welcome, everyone. I'm Michael Clare. I am a senior visiting fellow at the Arms Control Association and a member of the board. And for the past eight months or so, I've been working at Daryl's behest and the behest of the board to study the implications of emerging technologies, especially artificial intelligence, cyber weapons, hypersonic weapons, on the future of war and arms control. And uh, this has been a remarkable journey for me. I've learned all kinds of extraordinary things, and what I've learned has been pretty terrifying, uh, as you'll discover in this panel. I've come to the conclusion that these new technologies will have a profound impact on war, on nuclear stability, and arms control, and that our thinking in, this, in these areas is going to have to change profoundly in response. Everything I've learned has told me that the future of war will be profoundly altered as these new technologies come online. And one thing that's become very clear in studying this field, that the speed of development of the new technologies and their weaponization, their application to military use, is happening at a very rapid pace. And by the way, the key word here is speed. The common denominator, I believe, and I've learned a great deal from our panelists and their work, uh, the key, uh, com the, the common denominator in all of this, I find, is speed, the acceleration of warfare. It's going to make the pace of combat much faster than it's been in the past. And this has obvious ramifications for nuclear stability. How will this affect uh, decision making? the decision to go to war, the decision to escalate conflict in a crisis, decisions regarding the use of nuclear weapons. All this is going to happen at a much faster pace than in the past. And our thinking is going to have to change in order to uh, cope with this alteration in the nature of combat. And Unfortunately, until now, I think thinking in the field, policy making, has not kept up with the pace of the technological developments. So it's essential that we begin to address the impacts of these new technologies. Fortunately, we have an extremely knowledgeable group of panelists who I'll turn over to in a second. I've learned a great deal from their work and my, my own research into the field, and we're very lucky that they're here today to inform us. Uh, we will proceed first with Bonnie Dougherty, who is a senior researcher with Human Rights Watch and also works with the uh, International Human Rights Clinic at Harvard Law School and is extremely knowledgeable about autonomous weapons and their significance for international law and international humanitarian law. Uh, she will be followed by Amy Wolf, who's a senior researcher uh, at the Congressional Research Office Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress. She's a senior specialist on nuclear weapons and has written, from my perspective, the definitive study on hypersonic weapons and their impact on the battlefield. And finally, uh, Aaron Dubmacher is going to, from the Nuclear Threat Initiative, a program officer there in nuclear weapons and arms technology and a specialist on the impact of cyber weapons on nuclear stability. Uh, so again, we're very lucky to have these three uh, highly knowledgeable experts to inform us about this new topic. So first, 
Bonnie. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the Arms Control Association for inviting me to speak to your meeting today. I'm going to change gears from what we've been talking about this morning and address an emerging technology that would revolutionize warfare in alarming ways. In particular, I'm talking about what we call fully autonomous weapons, also known as lethal autonomous weapon systems, killer robots, there are a number of names. But by this, I'm referring to systems that would select and engage targets without meaningful human control. So that this step um, beyond existing armed drones, because the, a human would not be making the ultimate decision uh, to take a life. The technology is moving rapidly in this direction, as, as Michael indicated, and some scientists have said it could be deployed in years, not decades, unless something is done to preempt it. So today I'll talk about some of the challenges that fully autonomous weapons present, uh, why we believe that the best uh, response is a new legal instrument that would require them maintaining meaningful human control over the use of force, and also provide an update on the current state of play. So fully autonomous weapons raise a host of moral, legal, accountability, and security concerns, just to name a few. And we believe these outweigh any purported military advantage. With regard to the moral concerns, for many people, including uh, recently the UN Secretary General, the use of fully autonomous weapons would be, quote, morally repugnant. These uh, inanimate, there's weapons would be inanimate machines that could not truly comprehend the value of a human life and thus should not be given the power to take it. In essence, they would be reducing human life to an algorithm, which would deprive human targets of their dignity. Legally, fully autonomous, raise, fully autonomous weapons raise significant challenges with compliance with international law, notably international humanitarian law, or the law of armed conflict, and international human rights law. For example, IHL's proportionality principle prohibits attacks in which the civilian harm outweighs the military advantage. Balancing these factors requires the application of human reason and judgment to complex and dynamic situations on the battlefield. It would be very difficult for an autonomous weapon system to replicate these human qualities, and it could be not be programmed in advance to prepare for all the unforeseeable situations it might encounter on the battlefield. Another important provision of international humanitarian law I want to mention is the Martins Clause. This declares that in the absence of a specific treaty on a subject, which is the case here, civilians and combatants are still protected by the uh, principles of humanity and dictates of public conscience. So in essence, it requires establish a legal requirement to take some moral concerns into account when developing and using new weapons. The principles of humanity require that uh, people be treated humanely, which depends in part on the ability to provide, to apply compassion, something that fully autonomous weapons would lack. And the significant and growing opposition to these weapon systems show that they raise concerns under the dictates of public conscience. There are numerous examples, but just to name a couple, uh, a recent global poll found that 61% of respondents opposed the use of fully autonomous weapons. Faith leaders, Nobel Peace Prize laureates, and civil society organizations, including the global campaign to stop killer robots, have all condemned these weapons. And more than 4,500 roboticists and AI experts have around, from around the world have called for a ban on fully autonomous weapons. I'll touch more briefly on two other concerns. First, the accountability gap that these weapons could raise. There are significant obstacles to holding any individual responsible for the actions of any harm caused by these weapons. For example, a commander would likely escape liability, legal liability, because he or she could not um, predict and prevent the unforeseeable actions of a robot, and they could not punish a robot after the fact. There would also be evidentiary and uh, logistical challenges to bringing a manufacturer or programmer to account. And then finally, security um, is a major issue. The development of, the technology would of this technology would proliferate likely to non-state armed groups as well as states with little regard for international law. And it could also lead to an international arms race. So in response to these concerns, states and civil society have argued for a new legally binding instrument that would create a clear global norm against fully autonomous weapons. Such an instrument would follow the precedent set by other treaties banning uh, problematic weapons, chemical, biological, nuclear, uh, as well as landmines and cluster munitions. It would also follow the precedent of the 1995 protocol banning blinding lasers, another form of emerging technology which was prohibited preemptively. 
In our view, the legally binding instrument should include either, uh, either or a, um, pro a positive obligation uh, and a prohibition. The treaty could obli affirmatively oblige states to maintain meaningful human control over the use of force. And alternatively, or in addition, it could prohibit the development, production, and use of these weapon systems that select and engage targets without meaningful human control. The positive obligation is more future-proof. The prohibition um, addresses the development and production as well as use, and as I said, they're not mutually exclusive. And just a few words about the state of play. International discussions so far have taken place uh, specifically under the auspices of the Convention on Conventional Weapons, which is a um, framework convention that regulates, adds protocols that regulates and prohibits certain problematic weapons. I was at the last month's meeting in Geneva and there were some encouraging signs. The majority of states there are calling for a new legally binding instrument that would prohibit or regulate this technology. There's widespread convergence uh, among almost all states that human control is necessary over the use of force. States may differ on exactly the terminology they use or exactly what the content of human control would mean, but it's, in my mind, provides a basis for negotiation of a, of a new treaty or protocol. So challenges do exist, of course. Um, we are calling for CCW states' parties to adopt a mandate to negotiate a new protocol um, in November so that they would negotiate it next year. But we recognize that it'll be difficult because CCW operates on a consensus basis, meaning that any one country um, can prevent the body from taking the next step. Nevertheless, momentum is growing, and uh, states, if C states fail at CCW to take action, they should strongly consider, and discussions are already underway, the option of going outside of that body to either the UN General Assembly or an independent forum. So in conclusion, I would just urge those of you um, who are concerned about minimizing the humanitarian and security concerns uh, associated with armed conflict to support this uh, push for a legally binding instrument on fully autonomous weapons. And most of today's conference has dealt with uh, ways to address the last revolution of, of um, of last revolution of warfare, which was nuclear weapons. And I encourage you to seize the opportunity to take uh, steps to prevent the next revolution and before we go down another long and dangerous path. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bonnie. And Amy, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you for the Arms Control Association for inviting me today. It is a little unusual to be sitting at an Arms Control Association meeting and not talking about nuclear weapons, but for those of you who think hypersonic weapons are something new and scary, I've been covering this program, at least in the Pentagon, since 2003. And the fact that most people in this room, in this country, weren't even aware that hypersonic weapons were an issue until the last year or two tells you a bit about the fundamental problem with the discussion of these weapons. We know about them, you know about them now, because we're worried Russia and China are acquiring them. And that brings about concerns about the interaction between several nations having hypersonic weapons. <laughs> Yet I've been following this since 2003, so pardon me, I don't have depth of knowledge, I have length of time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna start, I'm, gonna, I'm generally gonna address two questions here today. The first is, what do we mean by hypersonic weapons? And I'm going to try and limit the scope of that discussion. And then, if we're looking for ways to use arms control mechanisms to address our concerns about hypersonic weapons, I'm going to ask, what do we mean by arms control? And I'm going to try and expand the scope of that discussion and really get to the point that Michael raised that the concern here is speed. And if I don't remember to mention that several times, the concern here is speed. So starting with what do we mean by hypersonic weapons? Hypersonic weapons usually refers to either hypersonic cruise missiles or boost glide vehicles, a weapon where you use a rocket launcher booster with a hypersonic glide vehicle on the front end that travels at more than five times the speed of sound, Mach 5. They can be long-range systems, they can be intermediate-range systems, they can be short-range systems. So to limit the scope of the discussion, I'm going to talk primarily about longer-range systems, but I will incorporate some discussion about shorter and intermediate-range systems after I focus on the long-range systems. And with these limits, that means I'm basically going to be talking about the U.S. program, which for years was known as Conventional Prompt Global Strike, 
but it has morphed into a sea-based intermediate range missile with a conventionally armed hypersonic glider. The Russian Avangard system, which has been launched on an SS-19 intercontinental ballistic missile, which means it's a long-range system equipped with a nuclear warhead. And the Chinese W-14 hypersonic glide vehicle, and I really, you can read a lot about the Chinese system. I don't have a lot of expertise here, but the guessing is that it's an intermediate range system and we just don't know yet if it's nuclear or conventionally armed. But those are the three key systems. If you're looking at a competition amongst nations in hypersonics, that's where the debate tends to fall. So in limiting the scope here, we'll go to those. So why do we consider these weapons to be a problem? Bottom line, they are very fast and they are maneuverable. If you think about the, uh, a regular conventional nuclear arm, but conventional ballistic missile, it launches on a, uh, a parabolic uh, trajectory, looks like an arrow going through the air. You can predict where it's going, it doesn't maneuver at the end, and if you had missile defenses, you might be able to figure out how to shoot it down. But um, hypersonic glide vehicles are maneuverable, so once they separate from the booster, they can change direction, cross range and down range. You can't predict where they're going, and they can possibly increase their accuracy by maneuvering onto the target. They are very fast. That shortens decision time, which can lead to crisis instabilities, and that's particularly true if you are talking about shorter range systems used in the theater of conflict, which is why I'll come back to those in a minute. And even those armed with conventional warheads can pose an escalation threat if they are used against strategic targets. There is some thinking that if their maneuverability improves their accuracy, you can use them to take out hardened targets that used to be uh, subject only to nuclear attack, and therefore you can start a war that is strategic with a conventional weapon, and that war might escalate to nuclear use. There's also the concern that not knowing whether the warhead is nuclear or conventional, the adversary might just assume it's nuclear and you have an escalation risk due to misperception. Um, then there's this bottom line, as I said, the reason we, the United States, or some people in the United States are so worried about hypersonics right now is the bad guys have them. Bad guys have bad stuff, we need to be worried. Um, I, just gave you four reasons that people raise for being concerned about hypersonics. I'm really only concerned about the second one, the speed one. And it's not that the other concerns aren't real analytic concerns, but I don't think they play yet. We can't defend against hypersonic glide vehicles because they're maneuverable. We can't defend against regular ballistic missile warheads right now either. So there's nothing, if I'm worried about Russia deploying a hypersonic glide vehicle in the next year or two, on the front end of its ballistic missiles, which seems like a likely path, I am no more worried about that warhead than the non-maneuverable warhead it already has on the SS-19 missile. I can't shoot that down either. That doesn't mean I should be comfortable in that position, but the hypersonic glide vehicle doesn't add anything to my discomfort. Um, I personally believe that the misperception problem is overstated. And since there's a camera back there recording me, I shouldn't offer you my opinion, but I personally believe it's overstated because there really aren't that many missiles in concern here or warheads in concern. We are assuming the Russian avant-garde is nuclear armed. We are asserting repeatedly that the U.S. system is not. We're not sure yet about the Chinese system, but when the Russians and the Chinese complain about the U.S. hypersonic glide vehicles, on conventional prompt global strike, they don't care about them because they think they might be nuclear. They care about them because they're certain they're conventional. And they're certain we will use them in a strategic way. So yes, they are escalatory, not because of misperception, but because we might actually use them against strategic targets. So I tend to not be as concerned about the misperception problem being escalatory than just about the capability being escalatory. Um, on the issue of bad guys have bad stuff, so we need it too, pardon me, but I think we should acquire weapons because we have a mission need for them, not because somebody else has them. And that's been the U.S. approach with hypersonic glide vehicles since I started tracking this in 2013. We have been looking at the Pentagon, in Congress, at the need for U.S. hypersonic weapons to meet mission needs 
What's been interesting, because I've been tracking this since 2003, is we've yet to quite settle on a mission. And it's shifted a bit over the years. And I could give you an hour of history about how the mission has shifted. But we have been looking at this from a mission need perspective. And while we were doing that, the Pentagon and Congress were willing to spend about $100 million a year on hypersonics. In the last couple of years, we've started worrying about the bad guys having bad stuff. And this year, in the FY 2020 budget, there's $2.6 billion for hypersonics in one form or another. So apparently, mission need is not as compelling as bad guys have bad stuff. I'm not sure that's the way we should be doing our military planning, but it seems that's where we are. So then you hear often that we're having an arms race in hypersonic weapons. The Russians are doing it. The Chinese are doing it. We need to keep up. I don't think we're having an arms race. There's a technology competition, no doubt. We obviously do not want to fall behind and be surprised by technological developments. We have the technological base. We didn't have the financial or priority system set up to pursue it when we were offering $100 million a year. But it is a technology competition more than an arms race. And primarily countries, the United States, Russia, China, we are not acquiring hypersonic weapons to offset the capabilities of the other countries' hypersonic weapons. And when I think of an arms race, I think they have it. We need to get it to stop theirs. It's an interaction within that trade space. And that's not what's going on here. We are not, none of these three countries are acquiring hypersonic weapons to offset hypersonic weapons. The United States is doing it, seeking to bolster its long-range strike capability so that early in a conflict, if critical targets need to be attacked early in the conflict, we have the capability to reach out and do so. The Pentagon for years has referred to this as a niche capability or a leading edge capability, where we would use it early in a conflict to achieve results against critical targets, like Chinese anti-access area denial capabilities, air defenses, anti-ship defenses. We would use it to, take, to, to suppress their defenses. By the way, that's why Russia and China want them to do it too, to suppress our missile defenses, which we don't have yet, but that's what they're worried about. And Admiral Mullen mentioned the turning point of the US withdrawal from the ABM treaty. You can track the Russian Avogadro system. It started in the 80s when there was SDI, but pretty much to the US withdrawal from the ABM treaty. Russia was worried the United States was about to deploy major ballistic missile defenses so that we would be able to take out their regular warheads and they develop maneuvering systems to impede our missile defenses. China's the same way, more in a regional sense than a global sense, but they are too looking at a region where we have missile defenses, anti-ship missiles, uh, there are other land-based missiles to defend our forces in the region, and we are in the region, and they would like to push us back, and that may be the source for their hypersonics. Absent an arms race because we want to get at each other's hypersonics, there really isn't a trade space for arms control either. So if your question is, can we use arms control to stop this technology competition with these very fast weapons that can be destabilizing, it depends on what you mean by arms control. So here I'd like to broaden the aperture a bit. A lot of people have suggested we should just have a test ban on hypersonics, freeze everybody in place. Or we should ban the weapons altogether because these things, bad guys, bad stuff, we don't want these or we should at least limit them so that we know what we are dealing with and that we can affect some kind of workaround if the numbers are smaller. But that assumes that the, each side fears the other's hypersonic uh, weapons more than it desires its own to achieve its military objectives. And since our military objectives and the other country's military objectives are not related to our hypersonics, your arms control agreement can't simply limit hypersonics. We might be able to have a conversation with Russia about limiting hypersonics if we were willing to limit missile defenses. Anybody think we're going to do that? I don't. So we might be able to have a conversation with China about limiting their hypersonics if we limit our presence in the Asia Pacific region. Anybody think we're going to? I don't think we're going to do that. So it's not a trade space for a standard style arms control agreement that limits, restricts, or bans the technology simply because the technology is frightening. That's what we heard about with autonomous systems. That's something you can do. Everybody is equally scared of those. Doesn't work that way for hypersonics. These are real military tools 
responding to real military threats for each of the three countries developing them. So what's the real problem here? As I said, and I'm going to repeat what Michael said, the problem is speed. The real problem is the speed of hypersonic weapons, particularly in a military conflict theater environment. It can lead to crisis instabilities and inadvertent escalation. This has always been a problem with this concept. The initial US concept, as I said, was to have a leading edge capability so that early in a conflict, we can suppress defenses or take out critical targets. Well, if you're the adversary and you know the United States can get a weapon there in an hour or less, you're launching out from under it in 30 minutes or less. That's the classic definition of crisis instability that those of us in the nuclear weapons world are very comfortable with. I, we're very uncomfortable with it, but we're familiar with it. When I talk to people on the conventional side of the ledger about long range strike and hypersonic weapons, they've never heard of that. Going first and going fast is how you win the war. They don't think about what the other side might do in response to the potential that you can go first and go fast. So here we are with 15 years of research into hypersonics and no priority, no champions in Congress, and all of a sudden the Russians and the Chinese start doing it, and now everybody's trying to go fast to get these weapons that are crisis destabilizing early in a conflict. And this, to me, becomes a signaling and messaging issue. If we have the capability to launch quickly at the start of a conflict and suppress China's ability to defend its airspace or defend its sea lanes, they're going to start shooting first. So you go from what we had considered a leading edge capability to shoot promptly at the start of a conflict to something that inspires preemption during the crisis. And that, to me, is really worrisome. Is there an arms control solution to that? Well, really, only if you broaden the aperture for arms control. And I know the phrase has been thrown around here today, strategic stability talks, anybody? That's kind of what I'm getting at. When you have two or three nations with capabilities that in worst case analysis could lead to preventive strikes or preemption early or even prompt strikes early in a conflict, you don't want anybody to think they have to go first because they're just too worried to wait. And that may require some level of cooperation, consultation, crisis communications to make sure that conflicts don't arise out of crises that turn into these preemptive crisis destabilizing opportunities. Thank you, thank you. And now, Erin, please. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the whole Arms Control Association team for inviting me. Um, what, I, what I thought I would talk about today were sort of what we worry about when it comes to really a trifecta of information communications technology or cyber threats that could lead to the use of nuclear weapons. Um, when, my, when I say we, I'm thinking of um, me and my colleagues at Nuclear Threat Initiative. And then I'm also um, happy to talk a little bit about some potential ways we might um, sort of resolve or begin to mitigate um, those consequences. So on the first, um, you know, there's, there's sort of this trifecta of cyber threats that we see could lead to more likely, increased likelihood for nuclear use. The first, of course, is cyber threats to nuclear weapons themselves. So with the nuclear modernization drive underway here in the United States, to what extent are our command and control systems and all of the related systems thereof increasingly eligible or somehow vulnerable to attack? Um, the US Department of Defense's track record on cybersecurity here is not exactly stellar, although senior leaders are definitely conscious of the risks. I could go into to more depth there. Um, at NTI, we hosted a few years back a cyber nuclear weapons study group um, who sort of thought through four what I'll call demonstrative scenarios with, through which cyber attacks could somehow jeopardize um, our nuclear command and control systems or nuclear weapons themselves. Things like spoofing of an early warning system that could lead to sort of false warning and nuclear launch as a result. Uh, cyber attacks on a communication system um, that could be 
could be as simple as something that's disruptive or disabling. Um, that could lead to, of course, misinterpretation of information, inability to de-escalate in a crisis situation, or loss of confidence um, that your launch order got to the person who needed it. Um, we are concerned, of course, also about malicious code or malware somehow being introduced into a nuclear weapons component itself. That's the supply chain risk that you've heard a lot about. That, of course, could also lead to loss of confidence. And then there's the cyber attack that disables some sort of physical security bar barrier or measure um, to getting at that, at that nuclear weapon. So that's, that's the threats that we're concerned about to the weapons themselves. The, the next piece here is, is much more policy related, and that is the expanding definition of threats, including cyber attacks and other non-nuclear attacks that could somehow necessitate a U.S. government response that would include nuclear use. So here I'm referring to the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review. And then the third is a little bit of a broader category, something that um, maybe historically we haven't thought about when it comes to nuclear weapons, but that is the information or the influence operations. Um, disinformation, um, deep fakes that can create somehow a misinterpretation of facts on the ground and the reality that ultimately leads to confusion, miscalculation, which in turn, of course, we worry could lead to nuclear use. So this is a new, and again here, the speed theme is, is, is here again. This is a new possibly sort of accelerated risk or means for bringing about the nuclear war by blunder that many have been concerned about for, for a long time. So what, what could we potentially do about it? So some strategies for mitigating the risks. I mean, here it's, it's tricky. Um, there are emerging challenges, many of which require some degree of international or cooperative efforts to mitigate and reduce. And I think here we need to be conscious that it's time to look not just at our old tool set, but any potential new, new tools that we could develop. So um, for the academics in the room, I might be able to give you a few research agenda pieces here. <laughs> um, but we also have to acknowledge here that technical fixes will be insufficient. Um, Senator Nunn and Secretary Moniz wrote not long ago about how we deceive ourselves into thinking we can solve the problem with technology and training. We cannot solve these problems with technology and training. Um, there are also you know, US policy changes that we can consider and then areas where, as I said, sort of more research agenda-like, more sort of further innovation and new ideas, frankly, are, are really necessary. So I'll start with the US policy changes. Um, we need to prioritize addressing cyber and information security risks in our modernization plans full stop. Um, that means doing things like enhancing survivability and resilience of nuclear systems and command and control systems. Um, that means enhancing the security of nuclear weapons and re reviewing those vulnerabilities um, throughout the system, um, not just to the, the sort of standard cyber attack that you might think of a hacker perpetrating, but also, or a, or a sort of nation state backed team of hackers perpetrating, but also the information and the influence operations. Um, we need to develop more options, this is on the policy side, to increase decision times, to try to, try to slow down um, the increased speed, um, accounting for the threats to the early warning systems and, and ideally reduce the risks of false warning. Um, and we need a declaratory policy here in the US that is clear but is consistent, it, that in, is intended to prevent the use of nuclear weapons and reduce our reliance on them for US national security. Um, on the multilateral side, uh, we need to reinvigorate dialogue between the US and Russia and of course extend New START. Um, we need to be preserving all mechanisms that we have that enhance strategic stability. We need to be establishing norms that discourage cyber weapons use against nuclear weapon system explicitly. There's a lot of work being done on cyber norms generally. Um, not a lot that has focused exclusively on sort of the risk to nuclear systems. And then we need to be maintaining a cadre of experts and building a cadre of experts, folks who understand the technology here as well as the policy side and can help bridge that divide. Now, here's the list of where it gets a little bit trickier and where we need new ideas and actions. Um, it's, of course, a perennial 
um, policy challenge to stay up to date and ahead of the risks of new technologies while we still come up with the ways to reap sort of the benefits of those technologies, right? I'm not saying anything new here. That's been true for decades before. Um, but we still need new tools to really manage this, and we need to get better at responding more quickly because the technologies themselves are taking us there. Um, we need crisis management mechanisms that are concrete, that are practical, that are near term, that build trust, and reduce the risks of conflict and escalation. Um, we need to build and strengthen what I'll call cyber secure cultures um, throughout the nuclear weapons complex. I think that, that extends to th us in the room even, right? Um, so each contractor, each node, and each network needs to be reviewed not only for the benefits that can be gained, but also from, from sort of digitizing or modernizing in some way, but also the risks of relying on a much more complex or interconnected nuclear weapons system for deterrence purposes. Um, the larger, more systemic issue um, is how we cope with sort of deceptive information and influence operations among all levels of government, and I'll extend that to society, just because it's a big problem anyway. We want to as well think about it in, in big ways. Um, technologists need to be working with governments, as is often happening, and more and more happening, I think, on the autonomous weapons side. Um, this is to some extent also true on the, on the sort of IT and cyber side. Technologists need to be working with governments to find out and sort out what those reasonable guardrails could potentially be. Um, we need to be thinking about ways to limit sort of the potential for deep fakes and other digital tools that breed deception all the time, but especially at times of crisis. Um, the same tools that drive clicks and repeat visitors to a website can accelerate nuclear risks and national security, and we need to be thoughtful of that. Um, governments can, of course, work actively to be the fair arbiter of what's real and what's fake. And then um, here's the so sort of cyber secure culture piece of this that we can all play a role in. We need to be thoughtful not just about where did that USB drive come from that we're considering putting in our computers. Spoiler alert, don't put it in your computers. Um, but we need to be mindful about each bit of information that we consume or share. And we need to be, as media consumers, you know, we can sort of speak with our views and speak with our attention spans and send signals about the type of content that we want to see and trust and that we want to sort of proliferate our, our national security environment generally. So at a minimum, we can avoid succumbing to propaganda and contributing to environments more generally full of disinformation. So I'll stop there. Great. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> I'm sure you found this as informative and stimulating as I did before I open it for questions, I, I want to ask each of you one, one uh, basic question. In my research, which depends a lot on your work, I find that these technologies interact with one another and converge and, 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 and have um, reinforcing effects. I, I wonder if each of you could speak to that, uh, if you would. Um, uh, well, I thought your point about the I think there converge. I mean, there's the technological convergence, but there's also the convergence in, in response. And I thought your point about um, technologists uh, taking stands against some of these developments was a really good one. Um, sorry to steal your your point, but it, it got me thinking. Um, and I think that's one place they overlap in terms like the Arms Control Association tonight is honoring, I believe it's tonight honoring um, Google employees, Google tech workers who who took a stand against Google's involvement in Project Maven because it would. Um, it would uh, potentially improve the targeting of drones targeting. And so that's not ex necessarily directly related to fully autonomous weapons, but um, it's related to that broader idea of weaponizing AI. And so I think that to, to get getting the response as well as the technology overlap is an important thing to consider. Yeah. Um, Amy, do you? The idea that the quicker the conflict gets started, the less time there is for human decision making, the higher the probability that the military or the decision makers will build in autonomous decision making, that's a snowball. Mm 
when you're dealing with hypersonic weapons in a theater, and one thing I didn't mention is in that $2.6 billion in this year's budget, each of the services, not just the Navy, but the Air Force, the Army, each is developing its own hypersonic boost glide system because everybody thinks this is the great way to fight the war because you can go fast. But decision, human decision makers cannot go as fast as some of these technologies can, and you're risking putting an autonomous launcher in there that just makes the whole crisis instability problem worse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what I knew you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would echo that. I would just say it's very difficult, in my view, to actually take them apart and discuss them all separately yes. in some of these yes. ways because yes. there's a lot of, um, so there's, of course, a distinction between whether or not you automate a decision path versus whether or not something is autonomous and whether or not, even further, it's artificially intelligent in some way. But um, it's very difficult to disaggregate some some automated decision making that we have already throughout a number of conventional systems. Um, and when we think about when we think about cyber defense, for example, it's very difficult to do without any automation. Um, so it's it's Im almost impossible to sort of pull these out. I think the 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 speed issue is paramount, but that also comes down to policy decisions that we choose to make about how we choose to slow down those decision paths. Yes. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that. I, I wanted to bring out this because our new thinking about arms control is going to not be able to, as Amy suggested, separate these out weapon system by weapon system, but to look at this whole uh, com combination of systems and how they affect one another. Uh, I don't know uh, how much time we have, but I'm sure you have questions that you want to ask our panelists. So if you'll raise your hand, I'll try to get people, and we have some microphones available uh, for uh, people who wish to raise questions. So please, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Is that you, Daryl, with the question? We have about 10 minutes left, Michael. Um, I wanted to um, ask a question of Aaron and, and of Amy about process and, and how this discussion on the impacts of these technologies might go forward. So first for Amy, um, you've, you, you alluded to the fact that there are members of Congress who are interested in keeping pace with the Russians and the Chinese on hypersonics. Uh, where, if anywhere in Congress, is there a systematic discussion about the the implications of these technologies, uh, what needs to be done to help foster the right kind of discussion that is maybe scientifically grounded. Um, uh, and then, Aaron, in, in your view, uh, you know, how can, first of all, the United States and Russia best uh, come to understandings about uh, the intersection of nuclear weapons and, and, and cyber security and cyber attacks? In the morning session today, uh, we, we just touched upon the lack of a, uh, a structured dialogue between the United States and Russia on a number of strategic issues. Uh, there have been attempts to get a structured strategic stability talks um, forum going. Um, I mean, what are, what are your recommendations specifically about, about how this issue fits into that, that dialogue? In Congress, there have been over the years discussions within the Armed Services Committee when they're developing the NDAA, the Defense Authorization Act, about hypersonic programs, not so much from the technological risk, well, actually, even from the technological risk perspective. Back in about 10 years ago, when the Navy was thinking of putting conventional warheads on D-5 missiles, Congress said no and withheld the money for it on the basis of a strategic stability type of argument. So those would be the places where the questions would come up and the committees and the staff have been aware over the years and have raised the issues. In the last few years, however, the discussion has not been about whether our systems impose risks on stability but whether we need to accelerate our systems to respond to the threats from other nations. And there's 
there's plenty of room for a broader discussion, but with all the other issues and timing on the agenda, I'm not aware of any amendments or legislation in the last couple of years that people have sought to put forward. I can't speak to this year, but in the past, it's been more about doing more to catch up rather than paying better attention to slow down. So a question there and then over there. Should, Chris. I, should I also respond to Oh, that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Please. So more directly, I mean, I, I would endorse what you know, Joan and other, many others have said um, as the need for structured strategic stability talks between the U.S. and Russia. Um, it, of course, this, this information and communications technology, just even the definition of what some of those mean for the U.S. and Russian societies differs on some levels. We've seen that play out in the United Nations groups of governmental experts who have discussed cyber generally, not specific to nuclear weapon systems. And so, um, I think that there, there's probably some good st strategizing to be done to think through the question of whether or not it's more beneficial to start with, or um, actually, yeah, start with um, thinking through the nuclear weapons side of the coin and then sort of how cyber affects that rather than start with cyber and then think about the implications to nuclear weapons. Um, but I think we should use every tool that has worked in the past, as I said. So there are crisis management mechanisms through some international organizations. OSCE is thinking about cyber norms and some, um, you know, lines of communication that could be used in crisis cyber related. Um, we need to be using, you know, Admiral Mullen mentioned military to military talks, uh, having an understanding to be able to de-escalate in a crisis situation um, when necessary even if it's cyber mediated. I don't think we need to throw away those tools by any means, we need to reinvest in them. Um, but then there are these other much more tricky questions that, and especially as you get into sort of the information and influence operation side of this, of course, that, that play a role. And we need to, we need to um, I think, prioritize and think through those, those, those bits of um, strategic conundrums. Did you want to add anything? No. Please. And uh, this gentleman. Wait uh, one second. I see. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, hello. Well, yeah. uh, how we can uh, solve this dilemma uh, of uh, one part, on one side you have uh, new uh, weapons, you know, um, manufactured, you know. Uh, we can't anticipate them. Uh, there are um, factors, there are actors behind them. We all uh, remember what I have said as an hour about the industrial, uh, industrial military complex. You have also the military. You have also the national, uh, the strategic national interest of states, you know, in one part. In the other part, you have the interest of the international community because we must regulate these weapons because they are very dangerous, especially, uh, specifically the nuclear arms, you know. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the dilemma. And also the panelists have said about, have spoken about international humanitarian law. International humanitarian law, as we know, you know, through the wars, all over the world, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Somal, uh, and others uh, wars in Africa, um, generally no, not, not applied, or not uh, fulfilled, not implemented. Most of the rules of the international, human, uh, uh, international humanitarian law, sorry, not, not, not fulfilled. How, how we can uh, solve this dilemma? Uh, because we, we can't know, we can't anticipate the new, uh, the new weapons. Uh, for example, uh, uh, also I want here to point to the definition well, then, then, of the United Nations. The United then, Nations said about the arms weapons destruction of, uh, uh, in, 19, in 1948, they said uh, uh, weapons mass destruction has the effects of nuclear weapons or similar, because we can know, you understand. After that, after this definition, we have new weapons of destruction, and it continues. How we can solve this problem? I think, I don't know if you, um, uh, you have the same opinion like me, I think the only way is that we, we come back to the, uh, secu uh, this, the collective security system. Thank you. Do, do you want to respond to that? Sure. Um, 
Just a second. I'll, t I'll take a first crack at some of those some of those issues. I think, first of all, in terms of dealing with national security interests, and you mentioned also development um, in the private sector, I think in the private sector there's um, a large number of of entities that some corporations, some uh, heads of CEOs and founders of um, AI uh, companies have come out against, at least if I can speak to fully autonomous weapons or autonomous weapon systems. And I think that they, and many of them see, they don't want their technology contaminated by the fact it might be used in ways that uh, many people consider unacceptable. And the same could be said of scientists. They, it's like scientists don't want their, chemists don't want their technology being used for chemical weapons. The same could be said for AI. So I think there's some incentive there uh, to restrict development without restricting the development of AI for good purposes. Um, I think national security interests, I mean, listening over and over again to states um, of all who may have very different ideas of how to resolve the problem, but who insist that human control of some sort is essential over the use of force, there's some common ground there, and I don't think I think that that um, will help restrict development in a, in a problematic way. Um, and I just sort of, I guess I would disagree. Yes, IHL is violated. All laws are violated to a certain degree. I'd hesitate to say that it's never applied and never uh, implemented. I think you can make, you know, I always, people ask me that, well, if people violate IHL, why do you even have international law? And one of my responses will be, well, people murder and we still have laws against murder. I mean, these things create st stigmas and standards that even if not applied um, everywhere and at all times, they are still an important do set a standard um, on the battlefield. So I think, that, I think that international laws are very valuable in this, in this forum. Thank you, Bonnie. I recognize this gentleman back there and, and then uh, you, you'll be this next if there's time, but please, this gentleman. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie, I want to take up that very question uh, because it seems like the effort to outlaw, let's say, lethal autonomous weapon systems under international law is an effort to make sure that there's accountability for decisions about the lethal use of force. Uh, and yet, I wonder if there is meaningful accountability for the use of lethal force currently when humans are all making the decisions. And when you have systems like uh, signature strikes where metadata is used sort of in lieu of intelligence to make decisions about who to target, why not just, you know, if the president's going to sign off on the list, the computer can be pre-authorized to just go down the list. Um, so how would, how would the accountability that you're trying to hold to actually be implemented, carried out? Um, so thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, a couple responses. I think first of all, I mean, yes, the accountability gap is one of the motivations for uh, uh, for taking a stand against fully autonomous weapons and developments in that direction. Um, I think that there, there's just because there. I mean, like you use the signature strike example. Just because there are accountability issues there doesn't mean that those shouldn't be resolved. Um, I, I don't think that's a reason not to try to resolve them in the other situation. Uh, but I think that um, I think existing, existing law has mechanisms for which to provide accountability and, um, for, for existing weapon systems. The question there is a matter of implementation. And I think with fully autonomous weapons where there's no human control over the, or no meaningful human control over the use of force, you run the risk that the international law cannot handle this. It's not, a, it's not designed to deal with this kind of situation. So it's less a question of implementation that the, the mechanism isn't, isn't uh, a good fit um, because, you know, the, the weapon itself is doing the, making the determination. So it's sort of a step removed. So that would be one response. And then just also to note that one thing to me that's always very compelling about this issue is that the range of concerns people have. For some people, and they, people, different people um, are attracted to different ones. But for some, it's the accountability issues the main. For some, it's the moral issue. For some, it's the security issues, technological issues, et cetera. So I, I, one thing that I find compelling is that even if any one of those were resolved, you still have 10 more that are a problem. So I think yeah, um, the accountability is certainly a, an important one, uh, but I think that's also not the only issue on the table. 
I think we have time for one more question, and I recognize this woman here. Thank you. I just uh, want to, uh, to confirm or please speak about the United States capability uh, uh, ballistic missile interceptor, which is uh, developed by Aegis. This capability is uh, cap capable to encounter Chinese hypersonic DF-17. Uh, and, and that's what the source said, so I just want to make sure that it is, we are on the top of the capability and encounter uh, hypersonic. Thank you. I'm not the person to ask. I don't cover missile defense issues to enough detail to know which systems are capable against which missiles. But it is absolutely clear that we do not have either enough or enough capability in our long-range interceptors to counter China's long-range missiles. At the theater level with Aegis and other shorter-range systems, there is more capability and more numbers of interceptors, but I am not familiar with which weapons are actually on the list. Uh, we've run out of time, uh, but uh, before we thank our panelists, I j just want to comment that all of them have raised the fundamental point that arms can, that, that as weaponry evolves and new technology is introduced, that arms control is going to have to evolve. And, we in the Arms Control Association are, are dedicated to continue to evolve uh, in that, our thinking in that way, and we'll continue to do that. So please thank our panelists again. Thank you all.